seconds, he said. Okay. And how, what, what is the audience? All residents and some practitioners. So a, a lot of uh, a lot of residents. Lots of them, yes. Okay. Severely. Good evening. Welcome to iFocus International Masterclass by Professor Keith Barton. Uh, Vanita will introduce Professor Barton. Thank you so much, Dr. Santosh. It's always a great, great pleasure. Uh, our guest tonight really very truthfully does not need any introduction worldwide. Uh, and the fact that he's giving us a talk here today is a coup d'etat uh, of sorts and really is testimony to the fact that, uh, you know, his uh, zest for teaching, no matter what the audience, no matter what the grade of ophthalmologist receiving it. Um, I will, however, take some time out to uh, introduce this very illustrious uh, glaucoma specialist um, to our uh, budding ophthalmologists, thousands of them, we hope, who would be tuning in uh, today. And indeed, it will be my greatest pleasure to do that. Um, Mr. Barton, as he started out, uh, and uh, at some point, I will also uh, explain why uh, in the UK, a surgeon becomes Mr. from a doctor and that you take great pride in it. Um, he's a consultant ophthalmologist and glaucoma specialist at Moorfields Eye Hospital. He's professor of ophthalmology at the University College London Institute of Ophthalmology and founder and co-chair of Ophthalmology Futures Forum and the International Glaucoma Surgery Registry. He uh, did his MBBS from Queen's University of Belfast um, and followed, followed by being a fellow, a member of the Royal Colleges of Physicians of the United Kingdom, fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in ophthalmology, fellow of the College of Ophthalmologists, which later be became the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. And um, he's also uh, received the Doctor of Medicine at the Queen's University, Belfast. He uh, is not just trained, uh, fellowship trained in glaucoma, he's also trained in um, cornea. And both fellowships he completed at Bascom Palmer, uh, 1995 to 1996. Um, you, uh, you know, uh, it is a great tribute to one of uh, the glaucoma specialists uh, worldwide that he was voted one of 100 most influential people in global ophthalmology. And he was not voted just once. He was voted in the power list twice uh, in April 2018, when he was number 10 and in April 2020 as well. And why not? He has delivered several lame lectures internationally invited as keynote speaker at several international uh, meetings, including the American Glaucoma Society Subspecialty Day and has several awards for best poster and best video in the past as well. His areas of interest are surgical man management of glaucoma, of course, and especially aqueous shunt devices and MIGs and secondary glaucomas. He uh, specifically the management of glaucoma in uveitis. He has been till very recently the editor in chief of the British Journal of Ophthalmology and sits on the board of various other journals. Uh, uh, you know, he's been invited, as I was telling you, uh, to lecture on every continent and has received a number of awards um, in, in the past. He's actively involved in surgical teaching, patient education, and also in charitable projects. Uh, he's been invited uh, visiting professors in the US, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and China. He, um, where his charitable work is concerned, uh, he, he uh, has worked as an investigator in the Tima Eye Survey in Ghana, in West Africa, and he also organizes a charitable sporting event. Uh, he has cycled from London to Paris in 24 hours in three successive years, 2017 and 2019, uh, raising substantial amount of money for charity uh, for patients with glaucoma. And the next one due, uh, I think after three postponements is now uh, due in uh, the first week of September. He is uh, someone who has actually trialed most uh, 
glaucoma devices, uh, including uh, being a researcher uh, investigator in the tube versus trap study, the primary tube versus trap study, the Ahmed Bawal comparison study, and so many more. He's also um, uh, trialed several MIGS procedures and also trabeculectomy trials. And it is in this field, trabeculectomy, that we want him to deliver a lecture today to our budding ophthalmologists and to all uh, generalists or even glaucoma specialists who have tuned in today to listen to him. Prof. Barton, the stage is yours. Thank you. For, thank you very, very much, Benita. That was a, a very, very flattering introduction, I was going to say. <laughs> I think that's the biggest introduction. <laughs> Befitting <laughs> you absolutely <laughs> to a T. Well, um, let me just get my... Um, my screen up. Um, it, it's always fun to be invited to talk about trabeculectomy because, um, you know, nowadays with so much else going on in glaucoma, there's a real danger that, that trabeculectomy gets forgotten. Um, now, and ironically, it, it's in countries, I think, like India that, that are going to be, you know, where trabeculectomy is still performed a lot, I believe, where, you um, we can perhaps try and ensure that this procedure never dies. Um, obviously, at the moment, with a lot of new commercial devices in glaucoma, it, which are very sexy, there's a huge commercial pressure uh, to move to new devices. There are, huge, there are quite a number of programs in the US that don't even teach trabeculectomy. So you've got you've got a commercial pressure not to do trabeculectomy. You've got doctors that don't know how to do trabeculectomy. And this is real, a real danger because this is the, the most effective glaucoma procedure that we have in our armamentarium. And, and it, we, we mustn't really let it ever die. I, I work with a lot of companies and obviously there's no financial incentive really to do trabeculectomies, but the reason a crude invasive procedure is still around after 50 years or almost 60 years, is that with appropriate case selection, TRABS will lower the IOP for longer, uh, uh, the lower the IOP more and for much longer than the alternatives. And uh, this has been obvious for a very long time. I mean, there, there are studies uh, um, almost 30 years ago uh, looking at TRAB versus laser versus medication. The Morpheus primary treatment trial in its day was a fairly crude trial. <clears throat> we didn't have static perimetry. Um, there weren't many medications, but at that point in time, surgery in the form of a TRAB, which was actually without antiproliferatives, lowered the pressure significantly more than medicine or argon laser trabeculoplasty. In the Clabber initial glaucoma treatment trial, when 5-FU had arrived and was used in some cases, and there were a few more medications on the market than before, um, TRAB was still more effective than, uh, than, uh, than medication. And you notice in both these trials, TRAB achieved a mean pressure of 15, which uh, by nowadays standards, you might not think that impressive, but now that the mitomycin TRAB is pretty much the standard in most trials, TRAB achieves a, a mean pressure of around 11 or 12, uh, uh, closer to 12 than 11, but still at, at that uh, area, which no other, uh, no other device in any other um, randomized trial can manage to achieve. What about trabeculectomy versus MIGS? Well, as you probably know, most of the MIGS randomized clinical trials, such as the iStent and Hydrus, are FACO versus FACO MIGS. They're not against trabeculectomy, but the in focus microshunt or pressor flow, as it's known, uh, they, they, they have conducted a randomized clinical trial. And this is just the pre proof. This is coming out in ophthalmology. Soon it's probably available online. And, they, and the only randomized clinical trial of TRAV versus um, uh, a MIGS device, and which the, the in focus is a subconjunctival MIGS, so you might argue it's not MIGS, but it's still a type of minimally invasive procedure. Pressure with, um, uh, with the in focus or with a pressure flow dropped from 21 to 14 at a year. Uh, pressure with a TRAB dropped from 21 to 11.2 at a year. So you can see <clears throat> there's quite a, an impressive difference 
between trab efficacy and uh, and uh, pressure flow e efficacy. And this was a really designed originally to be a non inferiority trial. And you see that the pressure flow does not get anywhere near the low levels that a trab <coughs> uh, gets, and on fewer medications. And where does this matter? You know, you could say, well, does everyone need a pressure of 11 or 12? Well, of course not. But for patients with advanced glaucoma, which is what the patients who probably um, are the patients that are the hardest to, to, to treat and uh, that ones that probably don't get the attention they deserve, it's very, very easy to overtreat mild glaucoma and undertreat advanced glaucoma. But patients with advanced glaucoma Trabeculectomy still seems to be the, the best option in terms of pressure lowering. What about trabs versus tubes? Well, um, uh, Vanita mentioned I've been in the tube versus trab study, but a better comparator is, is the primary tube versus trab study. The tube versus trab study was patients with previous um, uh, trabeculectomy failure or uh, cataract surgery, and most of the cataract surgeries were scleral tunnel cataract surgery. The primary tube versus trabeculectomy study, patients had no previous surgery, they were all faking. So this is a good comparator. And this is a bar vault 101350 versus a trab with 0.4 milligrams of mito for two minutes. And the primary outcome was cumulative rate of surgery at one, surgical failure at one year. Um, and in, in this study, there were 125 in the tube group, 117 in the TRAB group. And at three years, the TRAB group was achieving a two millimeter mercury lower pressure than the tube group at 12.1 millimeters mercury on 1.2 medication. So again, that shows similar to the in-focus study, these randomized clinical trials with mitomycin TRABs are getting between 11 and 12, which is significantly lower again than what TRABs were getting in the earlier TRAB studies, such as the Morefields primary treatment trial and the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment trial where, where mitomycin was not used. Um, so that is, so that, that's the reason that we're, that's the justification for me saying that trabeculectomy is still the most effective procedure. It's, it's even more effective than the Barveld implant. And, and the Barveld implant, as far as implants are concerned, is the most effective IOP lowering implant available in, in randomized trials. And you can see that the primary surgical outcome, which was uh, in the PTBT study of uh, uh, surgical failure at one year, you can see that surgical failure was actually quite a bit higher in the tube group than the TRAB group. Having said that, you know, the TRAB success rate was more than 90% and the tube success rate was still better than 80%, but it was still significantly lower than the TRAB success rate. Three years, um, you can see that the gap ha ha has narrowed a bit, or maybe the axis have just narrowed a bit. I mean, but at, at three years, TRABs are still more than 70% successful and tubes just less than. So that's the difference. And uh, in terms of failure, most were for inadequate IOP reduction uh, or reoperation for glaucoma. There were very few for hypotony. And the, the interventions, uh, the numbers of interventions at three years were, were similar between the two groups, although obviously the interventions were different. Tubes, some had removal of rip cords, trabs, some had removal of releasable sutures. And that, so there are different differences, but overall the numbers of interventions were similar. And the complication rates were similar as well, maybe slightly higher in the trab group, but not much difference. It's just obviously you get more wound leaks in the trial group. Interestingly, you get slightly more hyphemas in the tube group. Uh, hypotony and myculopathy was slightly more common in the trial group. Um, encapsulated blebs listed here as a complication, which is a bit misleading because that's not really a complication. If you want to hear the five-year results of this uh, landmark trial, uh, listen in to the American Academy meeting in New Orleans in uh, November when uh, Steve Getty, uh, the chief investigator, will be pre uh, presenting the surgical outcomes at five years, and I'll be presenting the complications. So whenever people tell you that uh, patients don't really need very low pressures, they're 
using that gen they're generally taking that from uh, as a miss uh, quote from the from the advanced glaucoma intervention study, which showed that if your pressure was less than 18 consistently, that you, your glaucoma didn't get worse. But in that particular study, those who did not get worse me, had a mean pressure of 12. And in fact, the risk of progression increased, increased uh, continuously with every, with every increase in pressure. So for patients like this, where any deterioration at all is likely to be uh, is likely to risk their their vision, then trabeculectomy is still going to be the best option because it's the the uh, the, the procedure that's that's most likely to achieve stability, and it's also also worth noting um, that that is all, oops that that is also true with people with paracentral visual field defects because they they are at risk of losing central vision, especially if they have a positive scotoma. So what's good about trabeculectomy is that it will lower IOP for much longer and more so than the alternatives. Uh, what's difficult about it is that they have is that case selection is critical for trabeculectomy, uh, uh, which is not the case for say a tube implant. A barveld implant will work on almost anyone to some degree, whereas a trabeculectomy is much more um, precious. It, it will it is obviously less predictable and there is a need for long intensive post-operative care to get it right. And case selection is critical for success. If you put in the wrong patients, they won't work. It's as simple as that. Whereas although tubes overall are less effective than trabeculectomy in primary cases, they do tend to work in anyone. Whereas a trabeculectomy works really well in some cases and not at all in others. And uh, this was a 24, year follow-up study, a retrospective study from Cambridge, uh, the home of trabeculectomy, arguably. And uh, you can see there's a difference in success rate according to the glaucoma diagnosis, according to the age of the patient, according to previous surgical intervention. And if you had previous intracapsular cataract surgery, the success rate was zero. So trabeculectomy you've got to get the case selection right. And trabeculectomy works best in virgin eyes who do not have secondary, uh, certain secondary glaucomas, do not have not had previous conjunctival surgery, have not been um, pickled until they look like a beetroot with medication, as happens in many countries. Uh, so earlier trabeculectomy uh, with in patients with less long-term medication is more successful. And obviously there's an ethnicity difference in success as well. 5FU uh, in this randomized clinical trial, uh, what was shown in patients with high risk of filtration failure um, to have a higher chance of success. But as you can see, it was still pretty miserable. And this, this was carried out in the late eighties, uh, 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 Chief investigator was Dale Hoyer and Rich Parrish at Baskin Palmer. And uh, it showed that if you ca carried out a TRAB in someone with a high scarring risk at five years, you'd only slightly more than a 20% chance of success. And success was only a pressure of 21. It wasn't even uh, a particularly hard target. And if the Pre and if you used 5FU, the, the success rate went up to about 40%, which was a bit better. Um, but still, it's not great. And that's, that's why we move towards mitomycin. But overall, the problem with trabeculectomy is that you, you can apply is the lack of predictability. You can apply the same dose of mitomycin to four cases and look, you can get four very different results. And this is, um, this is one of the challenges. What's also bad about trabeculectomy, now the naysayers, the people who who really have never been taught to do trabeculectomy well and who don't do very many trabeculectomies and uh, will do anything else except a trabeculectomy because really they'll justify it and say the patient didn't want so something minimally invasive. But the real reason they're doing them something else is because they don't really know how to do trabeculectomies. And they will say that end up the Midas and et cetera, et cetera, is a big risk. It's not a big risk. The big risk with uh, trabeculectomy isn't really endophthalmitis or hypotony maculopathy. Of course, these can occur, but the big risks are 
annoying little things like bleb discomfort, a variable vision from mild hypotony and astigmatism from mild hypotony, nuisances. Um, successful cases can cause long-term concern, and that, that's one of the problems. And this, this patient encapsulate this. This was a middle-aged HIV-positive uveitic male toric contact lens wearer who came to see me in London, but he also saw Peter McCluskey in Australia. So he was an Australian who seemed to go back and forward between London and Sydney. This guy was wearing a toric contact lens. You can see that it says okay on it, but th this wasn't really okay because he'd got quite an avascular bleb. He was potentially immunocompromised from, UV from uh, HIV. He was uveitic. Um, and the, unlike cataract surgery, where you take it out and forget about it, you, you always worry that maybe something will go wrong here, that he will get infection in the long term. And that's one of the challenges of limbal drainage. The fact that trabeculectomy drains right out the limbus is fundamentally one of the big disadvantages. Um, Don Budens published this series of uh, patients with dysesthesia. And you can see when this patient blinks, they get bubbles. And that cuts what Paul Palmer coined as bubble dysesthesia. Uh, and that's quite um, irritating for the patient. And a lumpy bleb can cause quite significant discomfort and especially a nasal lumpy bleb. The nasal blebs are more uncomfortable than others. And it's interesting that at the time when Don Budens published this in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, he had real difficulty convincing the, the editor of the journal that this was a thing. But for anyone who does a lot of trabeculectomies, you will see people who have got great blebs, great pressures, whose glaucomas are stable, but they're still unhappy because the eye is just sore. And that's a problem. How do we minimize this? Well, what we're trying to achieve is something kind of silly. We're trying to make uh, aqueous go vertically upwards. Oh, oh, so the aqueous comes out at 12 o'clock and has to defy gravity to go up into the superior fornix. Um, and getting aqueous to defy gravity is not easy unless, unless we get the patient to stand on their head all, all their life. So we're trying to make the blebs go more posteriorly against gravity. And in fact, of course, what, what blebs, what aqueous really wants to do when it comes out through a tr trabeculectomy flap is that. So we've got to try and construct our flaps so that aqueous doesn't want to go that way. It doesn't want to go to the side. It wants to go backwards. It's worth noting that when trabeculectomy first uh, started uh, all those years ago, um, the original Cairns trabeculectomy is different, but when trabeculectomy started, the flap was introduced because the she's procedure, this procedure was actually more dangerous. It was very successful, but at a high rate of endophthalmitis and a high rate of hypotony. And the trabeculectomy flap was brought in because that was safe. So trabeculectomy was much safer surgery than its predecessor. But as we made it safer, it scarred up more. The flap healed, you get subconjunctival scarring. So, and we have this problem with glaucoma surgery that, that safe doesn't work and what is effective is dangerous. And we brought in mitomycin to make it more dangerous again, so to speak. Uh, so more effective is more dangerous and safer is less effective. And this is the struggle that we have to try and make it both safe and predictable and effective. And there are things we can do with trabeculectomy to enhance the efficacy at the same time maintaining safety. It doesn't have to be a crude hit and miss operation. And despite all of this, trabeculectomy still remains more successful than medical treatment in the average patient. And it still remains more successful than any other operation in the average patient. It may never be possible to completely eliminate bleb related problems. I think limbal drainage where the trabeculectomy drains is fundamentally problematic. It's not ideal. Uh, we do it because it works but it's not ideal. We can minimize the problems with it, but we'll never get rid of them completely. And this is uh, you know, typical trabeculectomy. And uh, what, one of the problems we have nowadays is that many trainees, because they learn phaco, don't learn, learn how to suture, they never cut conjunctiva, they, they never see blood in an eye operation, and they get a bit queasy when they see something like this. 
and uh, we have to get around this because this uh, the fundamentals of proper glaucoma surgery are operations where you cut conjunctiva and you see blood and uh, you, you know you have to deal with that and 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 do it and not um, uh, not not everything can be a, a sutureless phaco. And telling your patients that a, a sutureless phaco is the best glaucoma operation we have is not true. Phaco reduces the pressure by 16% on average. They'll get about half of the patients will get a 20% pressure drop, but phaco does not cure glaucoma. So what is a trabeculectomy? Well, it's, it's fundamentally two things. It's a, it, it's a flow resistor with high pressure in the anterior chamber and lower pressure in the bleb. The bleb should not be an extension of the anterior chamber. It shouldn't just be the same pressure in the bleb. So the basic components are flow resistor and a low pressure chamber of the bleb. And the, we've got to have somehow have this, some resistance in the scleral flap or the eye will be a hypotenuse. And if we don't have resistance in the scleral flap, the eye will be hypotenuse unless the conjunctiva scars so much that it, it, it prevents hypotony. And in general, if you deliver that much aqueous to the conjunctiva, it will leak. So you've got the scleral flap and you've got the conjunctival entry and antiproliferatives enclosure. That th these are the two components if you deconstruct the trabeculectomy. And what you need to be able to do is make a robust flap and create a diffuse low pressure bleb. Position. In an ideal world, trabeculectomy should always be at the top, 12 o'clock underneath the eyelid to avoid discomfort and infection. Part of the problem with that is at the top, it bleeds the most. And it's tempting to make room so that you can do more than one trabeculectomy. They're doing them nasally and temporally. But if you do them off 12 o'clock axis, there is a higher risk of discomfort and infection. So you, ideally, you don't want them like this. You want them at 12 o'clock. When you're opening the conjunctiva and applying mitomycin, you need to think about what you're trying to achieve. Um, many people think of flap healing as being underneath the flap, but to be quite honest, that's not where it happens. Most flap healing is either episcleral like this on top of the flap. So a little layer of, of fibrous tissue seals the flap down from above. And the alternative is that aqueous does escape, but you form a, forms a ring of steel around the, the bleb so it doesn't uh, escape laterally or diffuse away. So this is the most common cause of trial failure. This is the second most common cause. And this is the least common cause. So don't obsess with putting antiproliferatives anti under the flap. The flap will heal if you've got a big flap. If you have a large surface area flap and not much flow, it will heal. But a surface area flap is, lot, is, is smaller. Healing doesn't occur. It is superficial healing under the conjunctiva. Now, there's various ways to do this. There's the limbus based flap, which paradoxically uh, is a, an incision in the fornix. And there's the fornix based flap, which is an incision at the limbus. So the limbus based flap is the way we used to do them. It's nice because they don't leak you make an incision far back, but there was a tendency to treat very anteriorly with mitomycin, and it also creates a posterior scar at the incision site. So what happens is you end up with these very avascular focal blebs because the aqueous gets trapped around the limbus and can't diffuse posteriorly because of the scar from the incision site. The fornix base flap, on the other hand, where the incision is at the limbus, you can spread out the mitomycin over a wide area. And what you want to do is not blast one area with mitomycin, but diffusely dumb down the fibroblasts over a wide area. So make a big conjunctival flap and spread the sponges out. And that way you're generally dumbing down the healing response over a wide area and preventing focal scarring. So the fibroblasts don't migrate inwards towards the flap. Um, there are various dosing regimes. You know, I tend to use higher doses, um, even 0.5 for three mi mi minutes, but I, then you've got to have a robust flap and know what you're doing, or you will get hypotony. 
and usually use a, a number of sponges over a wide area of superior conjunctiva. And this video is from a long time ago, but that's a typical fornix based flap. I was using half size sponges in those days. We, we, we just use full ones now and do a bigger area. But you see, it's quite a big peritomy and put it in from the side. I put it in uh, over a wide area. Um, I don't deliberately make the conjunctival incision this large, but sometimes, um, um, sorry, I'm just going to go back and stop that for a second. I don't make the conjunctival incision deliberately this size, but when you're putting in mitomycin, you need to stop the bleeding because blood negates the effect of mitomycin. And you find when you're cauterizing very thin conjunctiva, you end up accidentally extending the peritomy when you're trying to stop the bleeding. Now, even so, there's still quite a lot of blood around here, but you really want to minimize the bleeding when you're putting in the sponges because, as I say, serum negates the effect of mitomycin on the tissues. So you want the mitomycin to work. But I do do a big conjunctival flap, but that's uh, not that's uh, more than I would normally do. What about the scleral flap itself? Well, the size and shape do have an influence. There are multiple things that have an influence. Obviously, if you've got a big flap, um, it creates more resistance to the, the imagine these arrows are aqueous. If you've got a big flap, it creates more resistance um, than if you have a small flap. A big flap also has a greater surface area and is more likely to heal and scar down. On the other hand, if it's very thin sclera, a big flap gives you more protection and you're less likely to get hypotony. But overall, a big flap is disadvantageous in that it's more likely to scar and produces greater resistance, whether it's square or rectangular or triangular. On the other hand, it can give you a lot of protection if you've got someone with very thin sclera. So sometimes it's advantageous. You've, you've already heard where, where I think we should be going. Uh, we're trying to get agris to go there and not there. And uh, we want it to, to go up, up, uphill, uh, not, not sideways. So we try and make the flap to actually direct aqueous in that manner. And when I was training, the traditional British flap used to be like this. And I was taught that if you made the flap longer and further back, uh, i.e. here, then aqueous would all go out the back. And this, of course, is total rubbish. You know, if you make a long flap like this, no aqueous goes out the back. It just goes out the sides because the distance from here to here is much shorter than the distance from here to here. And what actually happens with this sort of flap is that it scars at the back. So no aqueous goes out the back. So the idea that if you make a, a long flap, aqueous will go further back is, is a dreamland. The American flap, which was always triangular, um, has more logic to it because it's broad base with more resistance laterally here and less resistance here. Because so this, this bit, the distance from here to here is is a, is not so much less than the distance from here to here. So hopefully you get the agris to go a little further back. Now, the type of flap that Roger Hitchings, my, uh, one of my mentors uh, always did was broad and thin and narrow. And Paul Palmberg also does the same. And well, what's the logic here? The logic here is assuming that this is not in front of the Tinon's insertion, it needs to be behind Tinon's insertion. Then the distance from here to here is less than the distance from here to here. So aqueous is more likely to go this way and less likely to go that way. So this is bad, this is bad, this is better, but logically this is best. So I make a transverse incision. I use a crescent knife. You, can, you don't need to use a crescent knife. It's just easy. You want a good two thirds depth, a reasonable thickness flap so it doesn't buttonhole. You need a flap that can be sutured easily, uh, not one that's going to cheese wire whenever you try and suture it. And take this all the way into, into cornea. Oops. Ah, here we go. Videos just take, I've got too many videos in this talk, so they take a little time to load. I still cut the sides. I tried for a while not cutting the sides, but the, you know, uh, as, uh, as what one of my cor corneal specialist colleagues once asked me how to do a self-sealing trabeculectomy, and I said, that's not really the point. 
Um, you don't want to say, uh, now you want to do a sutureless phaco trabeculectomy. And I said, no, 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 the trabeculectomy has got to drain. So you can, you cut the sides. Um, th this is not going to play clearly, but it's, it's basically a keratome entry. I'm quite sure why it's not playing. Oh, sorry, let me get you back here again. I'm just going going on to PowerPoint itself to see if the, the video, uh, no, it wants to convert, it wants to convert the video, but forget that. Um, will it play it? It'll play, yeah, okay. So yeah, it, it will play it without, it will play it without converting it. PowerPoint's being, uh, uh, being difficult. Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I use now, now that's not a regular keratome. That's the, one of the old ones when, when we used to make bigger phaco incisions. Um, it just happened that the video is from years ago. But I like to do a keratome entry, which none of none of my colleagues like. And I'll show you in a second why I like to do it. Firstly, you got no immediate shallowing. Um, now the alternative everyone else does is a blade vertical entry. So the horizontal keratome entry doesn't give you immediate shallowing and you don't get iris hitting the wound straight away, uh, which, which is why I like to do it. Um, and that's my own personal quirk. It, it's one advantage of using a punch over cutting a block, which we used to do traditionally, is that if you're using a punch to make the sclerostomy, you don't need to cut the flap right up to the limbus. Uh, whereas in the old days when we cut a block, uh, with a knife, you had to make the flap go right up to the limbus to actually be able to get it to the right position. With a punch, you don't need to open the flap to the limbus. And this is an obvious advantage because then the edge of the flap is not too close to the edge of the conjunctival wound. Um, so, we only cut, so we don't cut quite to the limbus with a flap. I like to use the Katina Lonsdotic punch. It's a very positive stainless steel punch. Um, and uh, you can see the disadvantage of going so far in, in using a slit keratome is, is that you have to go further in and you sometimes have to punch more because your, your entry site is much more into cornea. Now, a, a proper, a proper trabeculate entry site isn't cornea anyway. I mean, we really, these are not really trabeculectomies. They're, they, these are keratectomies really, <clears throat> but but um, you do have to make more punches if you make a, a slit keratome incision. And you do have to make sure that you bring it back to maybe half a millimeter from the back of the flap. Now that's very close to the back of the flap. You don't want to overdo it because you do need a step. But you can see as soon as um, you, you do the punch, iris occludes the entry site. And this is why it's absolutely essential to do an iridectomy. If you don't do an iridectomy, Say you've got a pseudo fake patient with a very deep AC. Okay, pardon me. You can get away without an iridectomy, but that means if you're massaging or taking out releasable sutures later, you can get a sclerostomy full of iris. Uh, it's a foolish. It's 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 risky not to do an iridectomy. So it, you 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 do the punch. You punch almost up up to the back of the flap, but not quite. You can't see the edge of the punch here because the iris is prolapsed. But, but don't worry about that because the iris prolapsing in actually prevents the AC from going shallow at this point. So th th these are not great anatomical pictures because there's no transition zone in them, but that's kind of the way you want the punch. Um, obviously, the whole thing is more and more forward than that, um, but you want the punch just um, exposed and no more. People used to cut back into um, over ciliary body, and the idea was that it would produce <clears throat> some kind of cyclodialysis um, and supracroidal drainage. But but they don't; they just scar up, and there's they bleed, and there's no advantage. With the very anterior one I do, there is a risk of actually doing a self-sealing trabeculectomy, which is bad news as well. So, oh, but that's very easy to fix because all you do is take another punch, and, and that, then it's it's clear. You also want to have the punch so that it's um, in the middle of the flap. And you see, this one's a little eccentric. Um, you, I, ideally, it should have been here. You want this distance, actually, ideally, to be longer 
than this distance because you want the aqueous to go uphill again vertically. You don't want it going out the side. So if you have to punch here, this distance will be shorter and this distance will be longer. So you're creating a little bit of resistance to sideways drainage. Of course, your resistance to drainage is dramatically altered by sutures. And you see here, uh, these are parallel sutures rather than stretching the flap. It'd be better to stretch the flap to one side. It creates better coverage. And here, there was actually some drainage out the side. Um, so I do another suture to, to actually um, uh, close it off. Uh, and th these three are releasable sutures, and this one's just an interrupted. And people, uh, I, get, I get a little bit upset when people say, I only do two sutures, or I do three sutures, or, you know, uh, in every single case. I, I do something different in every single case according to how thick the flap is, how thin the flap is, how much the drainage is. You've got to be prepared to be flexible to get it right. If you're an, an inflexible person who does the same thing in every single patient, uh, when all patients are different, you will get different res results in each patient. This is an albino patient. Um, you can see that's actually iris blocking the sclerostomy. And again, that's why you need to do an iridectomy. And here's the, uh, here's the iridectomy, which is, you know, everyone knows how to do an iridectomy. It's worth, if you have a dilated pupil, it's worth putting some pilocarpine or myocol in first so that you don't have a very, very large iridectomy. And why do you need an iridectomy? Well, this is the reason. <clears throat> Postoperatively, the whole difference between a trabeculectomy and non-penetrating surgery is that trabeculectomy, you can alter the pressure and the flow quite dramatically postoperatively in clinic. And if you're not doing that adjustment, well, you might not, might as well not bother doing trabeculectomies. But if you do do that adjustment, you can get iris incarceration. And that's why you need, I mean, this is a wide open sclerostomy. This is one full of iris. And this is why you need an iridectomy. And also before you perform any kind of revision or needling, if the pressure is high, it's worth looking on gonioscopy to see if the iridectomy, is in, if the iris is in the sclerostomy. We like to use releasable sutures for one reason only. And that reason is that it's too much hassle to go to the laser. Uh, you can do interrupted sutures and do laser suture lysis, but the beauty of a releasable suture is you can pull it out at the slit lamp there and then if you require. And this is the, the kind of the type of the four throws on a corneal buried uh, loop. Why do we bury the loop in the cornea? The reason is then you, you don't have to release the suture if you don't want to. We used to leave the corneal loop on the surface of the cornea. And in those days, there was a risk of keratitis from the suture and the exposed suture in the long term if you did not remove it. Nowadays, we always remove, we, we keep them buried. Because there will be patients where you don't want, there will be patients with low pressures where you do not want to remove the sutures. So you need them to be safe in the long term if you don't remove them. How do you put these in? Um, in general, pain cause self safe surgery system uh, uh, was promoted using pre place releasable sutures before you uh, actually enter the eye, which is, is quite a good idea. And uh, you make the corneal loop so that you can uh, pull it out later. And you don't want to go right through the flap like that. You actually want to go partial thickness and lamellar. Remember, if you've got thin, thinnish flaps, you can get buttonholing through, uh, through the, or you can get leakage through the actual suture hole. So you really want to do the, the bite more like this, um, which is a lamellar bite rather than going full thickness. The catch 22 here, however, is that if you've got a very thin flap where it's essential to go lamellar, those are the ones where it's more, most difficult to go lamellar. And if you've got a thick flap uh, where it's easy to be lamellar, to be quite honest, it wouldn't matter if you were lamellar or not. So the releasable sutures in place. Now, in, in the old days, you used to just um, fill up the anterior chamber and uh, after the conjunctiva was closed to see if a bleb came up. So that makes no account of any evaluation of flow resistance. And I see other doctors who fill the eye with viscoelastic. Again, um, 
if you put viscoelastic in, you're, a, you're basically saying that your scleral flap flow is unpredictable and you don't know what's going on. What we do, what's ideal really, is to close the scleral flap with no viscoelastic and reform the anterior chamber and look and see what's happening. So with no viscoelastic, you want to be able to judge how much aqueous is coming out. And ideally you want to have no flow, but to be just on the borderline so that if you depress the flap very slightly, very, very gently, you get flow. In other words, you're just on the edge between flow and no flow. So, so you get a little depression and you get some flow. And as I say, you've got to be flexible. Now, this is not Mike Trab, it's a colleague's, but he has put in one, two, four, he's put in seven sutures. Now, the point is, if you need to put in seven sutures, put them in, you need to do it. You know, you must not just leave an eye to go soft. Remember that mitomycin doesn't cause hypotony. Mitomycin preserves the hypotony that the surgeon creates. Mitomycin will give you hypotony if your technique is lousy. Uh, so it's important uh, to absolutely um, have the technique right. Now, there will still be occasional cases when you get hypotony, but you can minimize the unpredictability by looking at the flow when you're closing the flap and, and, and using your common sense. As I mentioned, trabeculectomy doesn't finish at the end of the operation. You've got the releasable sutures. You've got a, a flap that's adjustable with massage. There are things you can do in the post-operative period uh, to prevent healing. You can give a lot of topical steroids early on to stop the inflammatory response. And you can probably massage the drainage bleb as I'm doing here. Uh, to increase the flow. And what I tend to do is massage and see what the pressure comes down and then sit the patient outside for 15 minutes and then see if the pressure comes up again. And if, if I have to massage very heavily to get a reduction in pressure or if the pressure is refusing to stay down, then it's time to remove releasable sutures. And you can see this one coming out. Uh, when you're closing the conjunctiva, uh, close it tightly at the limbus. So you stretch it across the limbus. Now, the, sut the wing sutures at each side are designed to uh, tighten the conjunctiva at the limbus. The only purpose in the mattress in the middle is to prevent any conjunctival recession if there's eye rubbing. The, the mattress is not there to prevent leakage. The wing sutures hold the tension and they are there to prevent leakage. The mattress in the middle is simply to stop recession if there's eye rubbing. So why do, no, so we get onto the complication uh, side of things. I, I don't know how much uh, time you want me to talk for. Tell me to stop if it, if it, at any point. Um, uh, but there are many reasons why patients can lose vision from eye surgery in general and specifically from trabeculectomy. Um, the ones that we worry about most after trabeculectomy or really end up with Midas cataract. Astigmatism can be frustrating. Corneal edema is rare, to be quite honest, unless the patient's at very high pressure. And the biggest ones really are pressure too high or pressure too low. Pressure too high because the operation's not working. Pressure too low because either we got the suturing technique wrong or we took, uh, took too many sutures out too early. Um, Endophthalmitis is something that talk, was talked about a lot. Um, and endophthalmitis after cataract surgery is about three in, uh, three in 10,000 within a three, month, three months of surgery. So that's about one in 3,000. Having said that, it's eight times higher after posterior capsule rupture. So this is the, the UK National Ophthalmic Surgery Database. 
And after cataract surgery, most endophthalmitis is coagulase negative staph. And it's generally um, not very aggressive or fast moving, but it's obviously very nasty nonetheless. Now, trabeculectomy after tra trabeculectomy endophthalmitis is more common. Instead of being three in 10,000, it's more like three in 100. But the point, it, it, and the point is that it's, and, and in this study, overall incidence 2.6%, but only 1% in superiorly paced traps, which, which is perhaps closer to reality. Um, but with inferiorly placed traps, it was much higher. So don't do traps at, at the six o'clock limbus, that's, that's dangerous. And it's important to consider also if you're doing Zens or microshunts or any of the new subconjunctival MIGs, they can end up get end up mitis as well. Certainly, been we have reported after Zens, but we've not uh, seen any after Infocus yet. So it's more common after TRABS in most studies about one or two percent, but the likely causative organisms are very different. And this is a 1985 pre-mitomycin paper from Baskin Palmer looking at endophthalmitis after trabeculectomy. And they found the point was that they had a high culture positivity rate, 23% grew haemophilus and 57% were strep. So the point about it is that post-trab endophthalmitis is from much more aggressive, nasty organisms than you see after cataract surgery. So while post-cataract surgery endophthalmitis happens slowly and you, you can deal with it as long as a patient um, present, presents, with trabeculectomy endophthalmitis, you have to be on it the same day or the eye goes blind and into a bucket. Um, these organisms are very aggressive. So when the patient comes to you with a blebitis in clinic, if they have any anterior chamber inflammation at all, we treat them as endophthalmitis. Uh, and they get systemic uh, antibiotics and, and intravitreals and tap quite often because the time course is very different. And you cannot tell from a blebitis. If a patient's had blebitis symptoms for two days, you don't know if it's evolving rapidly into endophthalmitis. If the patient's had blebitis symptoms for, for a week, you know that it's not going to be endophthalmitis, otherwise they would, they, it would have happened already. But if the patient comes with a one or two day history and they've got some anterior chamber activity, this can be rapidly evolving endophthalmitis and you just don't know. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, there are some blebs that, that look more vulnerable than others. And those obviously we watch more carefully and we warn the patients. And I tend to tell the patients to come to the eye casually or the emergency department if they get any symptoms of uh, eye infection rather than going to their GP and to take some antibiotics, you know, probably to take a bottle of antibiotics with them if they go abroad. The risk is small, um, but, but, uh, but you do need to warn the patients in the long term. And again, this is true with trabeculectomy, but it's also with other limbal blebs. And this was a, these were Zen, uh, this was Zen related endophthalmitis. And we don't know about pressor flow, it's too early to say. But this is not the whole story. There's been, we, we did some audits of this uh, in the 90s, and you can see that the endophthalmitis rate uh, was much less. Uh, this is survival without endophthalmitis up here, with much less from 1999 to 2005 compared with 93 to 97. And I think that's really because the evolving TRAB technique um, in the late 90s produced some benefits. Uh, and you can see um, that one thing that's easy to measure was whether they had a limbus or fornix based flap. And the improvement in infection rates seem to coincide with the fornix based flap introduction. We've been doing limbus based flaps before. Now, I'm not saying that the flap type is directly related to the infection because at the same time as we changed the flaps, we started spreading mitomycin out over a wide area, applying more cautious, more carefully. There are a whole lot of changes made. But overall, the newer, newer techniques 
seem uh, to uh, reduce the incidence of infection. And uh, Pony Murray uh, published this. Uh, in fact, what she did do was a case control study looking at the risk factors for a bleb-related infection. And the overwhelming risk factor was chronic blepharitis. So patients are getting the bugs from their eyelids. So watch out for patients with bad blepharitis. Those are at higher risk. But this is an interesting uh, graph because it shows um, how uh, conjunctival flap te technique changed from the early from the mid '90s to the late '90s and 2000s, uh, and with the introduction of the fornix-based flap, the infection rate dropped um, by threefold. And leb related infection still happens if you do a lot of trabeculectomies, but it is relatively rare. It's not as rare as endophthalmitis after cataract surgery, but it is much rarer than it was. And chronic blepharitis is a big risk factor. So identif identify and warn at risk patients. And also a patient presents with blebitis, beware of rapidly evolving endophthalmitis in the patient who has a short prodrome because if they have a short prodrome, you don't know if they're developing a rapidly evolving endophthalmitis. If they've had the symptoms for seven or 10 days already, you know it's not rapidly evolving. If they had the symptoms for one or two days, you just don't know. We treat anyone with cells in the anterior chamber as potentially evolving endophthalmitis. And we try to avoid uh, avascular blebs of any sort at the limbus, although it's, it's difficult to avoid. Uh, with uh, with everybody with a trab, but uh, we use a lot of steroids post-op, which I think reduces the uh, the focal nature of the bleb. We do the fornix based flap, and we apply mitomycin over a wide area, and all these create more diffuse blebs, which are at lower risk. Cataract after uh, trabeculectomy is much talked about after the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study that showed that trabeculectomy was much more effective than medicine but it was also much more effective than medicine at causing cataracts. Um, and you can see that the difference, the Singapore 5F use uh, uh, trabeculectomy study uh, showed that actually, uh, as um, I think, uh, uh, if you look at uh, intraocular pressure control and disease progression at three years, 5FU had a small benefit over placebo. It wasn't a big benefit. Um, and at eight years, there was still a small benefit. But um, the problem was that uh, 5-FU trabs in Singapore seemed to be better at causing cataracts than they were at controlling the pressure. And, uh, that, it, and, and uh, that was a, a significant issue that trabeculectomy uh, seemed to have a high rate of uh, cataract surgery afterwards. And uh, Henry Jampel wrote, wrote this uh, editorial in ophthalmology. That's hard to avoid. What I would say is when you're staging glaucoma surgery, the evidence suggests that, well, firstly, glaucoma is irreversible. So you've got to stop it progressing. Cataract surgery you can take out, you can do any time. Trabeculectomies are more successful in phagic eyes than they are in pseudophagic eyes. And interestingly, even if you take the cataract out afterwards, there is, yes, some trabeculectomies fail, but trabeculectomies in phagic eyes, even when you need to do cataract surgery afterwards, are still more effective than trabeculectomies in pseudophagic eyes. Pseudophagic trabeculectomies don't do quite as well for some reason. Astigmatism, I mentioned, you know, this is, this is one of the many frustrations, but not dangerous problems. If you get, um, if you do a successful trabeculectomy and the pressure goes down, if you do it, especially in a young person, say a 25 year old myope, which you may have to do occasionally, you can get quite dramatic uh, uh, reduction in axial length and astigmatism. And 
if the eye is soft, even the globe contents, the orbital fat, everything can compress the globe a little bit and add to the astigmatism. And that can be frustrating. And in this publication, um, an eye showed that traps tend to cause withdrawal astigmatism, especially when they're placed supranasally, more so supranasally. But the greatest astigmatism is when the trab is most effective. So the bigger the pressure drop, the more the astigmatism. Corneal edema in general is not associated with trabeculectomy, but we do see glaucoma patients who get corneal edema. Obviously tubes and can do it, but, but um, patients who have had very, very high pressures lose endothelium and re needing to repeatedly revise trabeculectomies, patients do get corneal edema. And obviously they can lose, uh, 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 they can lose endothelium because uh, cataract surgery is often more difficult in glaucoma patients. And there are numerous reasons why they can get corneal edema, but it's not such a big issue with trabeculectomy. In fact, things like a droopy eyelid afterwards and, and rarely an occasional double vision, which are other problems, are actually sometimes more difficult to deal with. Pressure to high is obviously glaucoma, and that requires uh, management as required either needling, revision, or, or you do a tube or medication. Pressure too low is an interesting one. What is pressure too low? Less than six, three standard deviations below the mean. Practical definition is six on two consecutive visits after surgery or one visit if the pressure is low enough to warrant intervention. What are the risks from hypotony? Well, you know, as I mentioned, you can get astigmatism, which is frustrating. You can get reduced axial length, uh, which, which can be confusing if it creates an isometropia or if you have to do biometry for cataract surgery and the, and the pressure might go up during the cataract surgery. So you might end up with an inaccurate biometry. And then, of course, there's the dangerous ones such as hypotony maculopathy and uh, choroidal hemorrhage. And the variable length from globe deflation I mentioned already, um, which, uh, which, which is only, if, if you're new to trabeculectomy and you start doing it on 20 year old myopes, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll discover that how painful uh, this is because they, they get these miles, they can be six, five, but have much worse astigmatism than they had before. Or, or the 50 year old who gets cataract and needs cataract surgery and that you can't get an accurate biometry because the axial length's been reduced by one millimeter compared with the other eye and you don't know what really to gauge it at. Then there's hypotony maculopathy and the risk of permanent macular folds, choroidal hemorrhages and effusions, uh, which are visually potentially devastating. Obviously, you have to consider revision if you get hypotony and there are risks for revision, pressure too high or failure to correct hypotony. And the interesting thing with revision for hypotony is um, that the risk of pressure too low or a current hypotony is probably worse than the risk of pressure too high. Obviously late hypotony and early hypotony are different things. Early hypotony, sometimes uh, you can stop the steroids and just wait for the eye to heal and the pressure goes up. Late hypotony, you can't do that. And late hypotony can be a diagnostic dilemma. You know, you, you, can, um, you can see the patient with almost no drainage bleb and a low pressure and wonder what's going on. Management, well, early hypotony, you reduce the steroids that the eye heal. You may add atropine if they're choroidal effusions. You might give viscoelastic injections simply to simply to temporarily increase the pressure. I tend to put um, viscoelastic into an insulin syringe and inject it at rate um, tangentially at twelve o'clock. So that if the eye, if, and if sometimes we do this in fakey guys, and if the patient moves, then you don't hit the lens. And you can do this at the slit lamp and temporize. Um, and if you're going in tangentially, you're never gonna hit the lens, even if the patient jumps. Late hypotony, sometimes the kick. Now this, this was a patient with no obvious drainage bleb six months after phaco trab, and this was 20 years ago. And this was, a, I've seen several cases like this since. 
But this patient had no obvious drainage blab, but an open sclerostomy. And if patient gets hypotony and there's a trap, you've got to blame the trap until proven otherwise. So how do you prove it's a trap? Well, it's a simple method is to inject some gas into the anterior chamber. And if you get and you send the patient away, see them a day later. And if you get um, subconjunctival emphysema from the gas in the anterior chamber, then you know that clearly the trab is draining. Um, and that can be useful if there's no clear bleb and you're not really convinced it's the trab. This can prove to you that it is the trab, and then you know you need to revise the trab. If you're injecting gas, do it at six o'clock because the gas comes back outside the hole you put it in. And you can use air, you can use C3F8, SF6. And in this case, uh, again, uh, th this was a uveitic and I wasn't sure if they got hypotony from the uveitis or the trab or what, but look, uh, subconjunctival space is full of gas straight away this time. So that was clearly an overdraining trab. So late hypotony from trabs. Trabs had good pressures for years and suddenly goes low. Um, this is worth doing just to, to convince yourself it's a trab if you remain unconvinced. You've heard this already from the previous part of the talk. What are we trying to achieve when revising a bleb with hypotony? Um, leaking blebs do not cause hypotony. Hypotony causes leaks. Leaks don't cause hypotony. You, an inadequate scleral flap causes hypotony and can cause a leak by delivering too much aqueous to the conj. The conjunctiva is not designed to withstand eye pressure. It's not supposed to have aqueous under it. And if you get too much aqueous under the conj, it will leak. But if you get hypotony, you've got to fix the scleral flap. You know, if you've got no scleral flap resistance, then the conjunctiva is eventually going to leak, especially if you have a nasty focal little bleb like this or a very color stud bleb like this. And, uh, you know, it just keeps at it. So conjunctiva is not designed to withstand aqueous pressure from the anterior chamber. Now, there are numerous semi-conservative methods injecting blood into the anterior chamber, inject, or sorry, injecting blood, blood into the bleb. In my experience, when you inject blood into the bleb, if you've got an inadequate scleral flap, you will simply be injecting blood into the bleb, which will then drip into the anterior chamber and you'll end up with a huge hyphema. You can inject blood around the bleb, but overall, in my experience, this does nothing. This does not fix hypotony. And compression sutures are good for dysesthesia, but they don't fix hypotony. You need to repair the scleral flap. Conservative press procedures in general don't work. And if you look at these, interestingly, in my practice, the most hypotonous blebs are paradoxically the nicest looking blebs, the diffuse posterior ones that you wish you could get, and then they get too low. And uh, you've got to really... Um, revise these and the way I do it is I take the conjunctiva off the top, gently separate it from tenons, try and avoid disturbing the bleb. And very often you see this kind of diffuse tenons bleb, this thin capsule. It, it's not scarred the way it is in the patients that fail. So you've got to open it up and take a look and see, see what's there. You need to have paracentesis, obviously, because if you've got an overdraining flap, the eye will go soft, even softer. And you can see what's happened here is there's no sutures and the flap's wide open. Um, now, people do do transconjunctival suturing and things, but I, personally, I like precision and I like to be able to see what I'm doing. And usually, in this case, hypotony is 
come from over enthusiastic laser suturing of uh, lasers, lasering sutures or removal of sutures. So you just put the sutures back in. So um, flaps wide open, replace the releasable sutures back in again. If there's a thinner inadequate flap, it's not so easy. You may need to put extra sutures in, but you might not be able to put extra sutures in if the flap's very thin. Um, you may need to patch it. I mean, this one doesn't look particularly impressive. Um, didn't seem to be much flow. So I inflated the anterior chamber. And then suddenly there's flow coming out from the side. So that needs more sutures there. And now this is the difficult bit. As the flap's very thin, you might not be able to suture it here. And in this case, you can see I put in a number of extra sutures, but it's still draining. So then what you do, you take a piece of pericardium, or you can use tenons if there's nothing else available. The trouble with using tenons is it often scars up and encapsulates. Pericardium is pretty good for this. And uh, when, if you're putting sutures back in, simply I, I tend to use a lot of releasable sutures. Um, if, if I'm revising it for a second time for a hypotony, which sometimes happens, then I really close it tightly and use uh, interrupteds as well. But then I check the flow again. And remember the biggest risk factor after revising for a hypotony is that the patient goes hypotenuse again. It's not that they go too high. So conservative approaches may be good for dysesthesia, but they're no good for uh, hypotony. Uh, it's relatively easy to fix over draining bleb if the sutures have been cut or pr removed prematurely. You simply put them back in. But thin flaps that are difficult to suture or uveitics who develop hypotony with very little outflow are more difficult to de deal with and you may need, need to use a patch. Leaking blebs don't cause hypotony. Hypotony causes leaking blebs. And the biggest risk factor when you resuture these isn't that the pressure goes too high. It's actually these tend to be lower scarring eyes and the pressure goes too low again, which is frustrating. So what about choroidal cysts? I mean, I, I can stop any time. This is the last video, the last seven minutes, but this is about choroidal hemorrhage. Um, and uh, this is something that I deal with, fortunately, very rarely. But... and. You know, there are two devastating complications from hypotony after IOP lowering surgery. There's maculopathy, and this is bad maculopathy that you can see in the video, and there's choroidal hemorrhage. And this patient has got a huge choroidal effusion, uh, which differentiates from hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is extremely painful and sudden in onset. Effusions are not painful and not usually sudden. This was a sudden onset loss of vision four days after a tube operation many years ago. With conservative treatment, nine days later, still very, you can see it's opaque hemorrhagic uh, elevation. One day after revision to restore the pressure, there's still a lot of hemorrhage. And you really need to drain this, otherwise the eye becomes thysical. And if you do drain it, sometimes you can have a spectacular improvement in vision. Many times you will not get an improvement in vision. You will just stop the eye becoming thysical. So here's the 69-year-old man, 12, uh, severe pain while gardening four days after a trab. Um, a pre when, he, when I first saw him at presentation, I could see the choroid in the pupil right up against the, the lens. But uh, for, I injected viscoelastic and four days later, I took this video and you can still see the choroid through the pupil, but much further back. Now, we hadn't looked after this guy beforehand, so we don't know the history, but apparently he didn't have hypotony before the hemorrhage. And uh, So I had an operating list on day six after the hemorrhage. So I took him to the operating theater and I used uh, 
seven oh silk traction sutures. Now I drain these myself because I found that the retinal surgeons would either delay them, put them off, or put a whole lot of silicon oil in the eye for no reason and do a vitrectomy. And if it's uncomplicated, other than the hemorrhage, if it's a trabeculectomy associated uh, problem and there's no other retinal problem, I think it, it's useful uh, skill to be able to drain them yourself. And you want to drain them as far back as possible over the apex of the uh, actual hemorrh hemorrhagic area, not at the limbus. So I want about 10 millimeters back. I use traction sutures again to, to give some visualization. Cauterize the sclera. <clears throat> I also got an infusion in the eye to maintain pressure. That's 10 millimeters back. Well, oh, about 12 millimeters back. And I make a V-shaped scleral window. I, this seems, to, my hands, this seems to be more effective than just making a slit. And I open it up. I cut backwards so not so as not to puncture choroid and uh, hopefully get some blood coming out. And once blood starts to drain, it can be pretty dramatic, as you'll see in a second, I think. And it's hard to complete the wound because you can't see what you're doing. Whoa. And this, you can see this dark altered blood, deoxygenated blood. Uh, you, you need to get this out of the eye or you have no chance of restoring vision and you will have a, a physical eye. And what you do now is you just keep mopping and waiting. And the biggest mistake you can make is to stop too quickly um, because it takes time to get rid of the blood. And this was six days after the, the uh, hemorrhage, which was a little early, but um, because it might have clotted. And if it had clotted and I was getting nothing out, I would uh, have aborted. But you, you can sit here for 20, 30, 40 minutes get draining this. And you need a lot of swabs. And when the drainage starts to slow, then I might enlarge this incision very, very slightly. But now you've got to be very careful. You can use a cyclodialysis spatula to just gently depress the wound. And, and what happens is the choroid can, can bulge into the wound and then you don't then it stops the blood draining. So you can see there with slight depression at the wound, suddenly you get a lot more blood again. And gentle persistence is the key to success. And then when you're finished in one quadrant, you do the other quadrant. And with a bit of luck, you won't find very much blood in the other quadrant because you'll get rid of most of it. But the, the biggest mistake, as I say, in this pr procedure is lack of persistence and not getting rid of all the blood. I leave the windows unsutured and I have gone back in an occasion uh, afterwards in one or two of these cases and then find that blood has drained in this, into the subconjunctival space, which is good. And then just use to seal tissue glue to close the conjunctiva. Now, th th this guy was very, very lucky. Um, I don't know quite how he managed it, but he got back to 6-9, which was spectacular. But... Um, Obviously, a lot of these cases uh, will have permanent visual loss, but you can at least stop them going physical. Um, 
And I think the amount of visual loss really depends on, I think, whether the hemorrhage was avoid, evolve, involving the macula or not. See, one month later, um, he was 6'9 with a pressure of 20. It was quite unbelievable. And that's not normal. But uh, I have had two patients who have done, who've done that. And you can see that they're, they're healed well. And surprising is posterior pole looked very good. So I can only imagine that hemorrhage must be coming in from the side and missing the macula. Um, and, and that's it. That video is online if uh, anybody ever needs to drain a choroidal hemorrhage. So that's pretty much my kind of um, tour of uh, trabeculectomies and what you know, case selection, what can go wrong, how to improve the technique. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Barton. That was riveting stuff. Absolutely. You know, so many points that we have picked up as well. Um, that was a really long talk. And yeah. uh, are you happy? <laughs> are you happy to take questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. I'm supposed to be meeting uh, a colleague to, uh, I've just got to text him to remind him, but uh, uh but uh, I'm happy. Yeah, but I'm I'm very happy to take questions. Excellent. Um, at this point, I would uh, invite um, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pradeep for their uh, you know comments, impressions, uh, and any questions that they might have before I move on to questions from the uh, residents. Okay, Keith. I think I, I will have to remember when I last attended such a beautiful lecture. Because I learned so much. You, you, it was you people are too kind. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it was so, the beauty was in the simplicity. I think for the students, it was wonderful. The entire trap you it told so beautifully, but the more, the best thing I loved about it, that you put each procedure in its place. Because I've seen people push MIGs and they push yeah. tubes beyond what they have, to, they have to be done. One has to be clear that each one has its own place. And, uh, and I was so bugged that there was a guy from a company for se selling the micro pulse as an alternative to trap. And so many of the practitioners who are not doing it actually fell into that trap. And ultimately the truth prevailed and they, 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 they realized what it was all about. So that uh, this was is the problem. You know, I mean, every, every technique has a place, but, but there's some, um... You know, the, the, the trap needs to be uh, protected because it's still more effective. We, we, need, we need common sense here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's I, so, so beautiful you put the common sense into, I hope, into head of everybody. And so since uh, we will be having many questions, just one quick question. Uh, do you teach massage to some of your patients and sometimes do you tell them or do you just do it yourself sometimes? Or just I just do it myself in clinic. I don't teach it. Some of my colleagues do. The, tr the trouble is, you know, you don't know what's going to happen if a patient's massages them. You know, some, some might come back with a flat chamber and others, you know, don't do anything d decent. So I, ne I, never, I never really taught massage, but certainly some of my colleagues do. And do in future you ever see tube because there are people in the US who have, who have started teaching their students first to do tubes and then to do traps. Do you see, foresee that kind of a thing? Now, I, the, the only situation, obviously, you know, for neovasculars and a lot of people, we do do tubes first thing. Yeah, that's different, but, but for a routine yeah, piece. For a routine primary open angle. The only situation, I don't do tubes first thing. There, there are a couple of situations where I might. Patient lives a long way away. You know, with TRAB, you really do need the follow-up. Um, patients from overseas or live a long way away, I'm a little more likely to do a tube first line. Black patients, we don't know what to do first in the black. We, so we have a lot of African patients. TRABs, you know, MIGs don't work. TRABs don't work. Tubes work but you know not very well nothing really works and we don't know what the best thing to do there is and i feel with them sometimes i should be doing tubes first but i, I don't know 
Um, I know in the US there are programs that teach tubes first um, because they were worried about end up with mitis and things with traps. But you know, tubes, tubes come with exposure risks and so forth as well. It's not, you know, I, and traps still, the other thing is when they were teaching tube first was before the evidence came out that tubes were less effective in primary open angle glaucoma. So that predated PTBT. Yeah, thank you so much. Pratip, uh, can you go ahead, please? Yeah. You're mute. Pratip, you're mute. Thank you very much, Professor Keith. I can only say that, wow, it was a wonderful lecture and uh, we thank learned you. a lot. And you know, so far my thinking was that the surgery is an art. But now today, first time I have realized that surgery is more a science rather than the art. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it's, it's... yeah, I, 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 you know, when I started doing TRABS, I thought, you know, this operation is all over the place, you know, and it, you know, and there was a number of people, um, Pang Ko started trying to break TRAB down, but he took it to a very extreme degree using a, an infusion and everything because he was doing them on these babies where you had to be very, very, uh, uh, careful with everything and that's not appropriate for a lot of our patients but a lot of what he said made a lot of sense and we I, th I think it was the introduction of mitomycin forced us to turn it into a science because we had to start thinking about what we were doing other because with mitomycin if you didn't think about what with what you're doing you got into big problems um there may be many questions but i just have one question you said that the prep do better in the uh, fakey eyes yeah. This statement holds true even for the angle closure disease? Even with what, sorry? Angle closure disease? Ah, uh, oh, we don't know. Angle closure is a difficult one. You know, I used to do, see my colleague, Paul Foster, who's the expert in angle closure, says you have angle closure, you take out the cataract. That's what you do. But, you know, we see these people with very advanced angle closure and very bad discs. I know if I take out the cataract, the pressure might still be 25 or something like that. And then I'm gonna to have to do a trab on a hot eye straight after the cataract surgery. And those people, I tended to do phaco trabs. Um, I don't do many phaco trabs, but those who present with advanced angle closure, you've got to take out the lens, you're absolutely right. Um, but I would tend to combine it with, cat with trab because I'm worried that the phaco just won't be enough. Um, but I, we don't have hard evidence on this. Thank you very much. Right. On that same vein, um, you know, if you were to do a cataract surgery after trabeculectomy, what would, uh, you know, the precautions be? Uh, what would you do uh, differently at the time of surgery, after surgery? But well, usually wait six months. Um, Okay. I usually give a mitomycin injection. Um, a lot of my colleagues give 5-FU injections, but we, we stopped doing it. I remember it was Roger Hitchings in, in 1995 or 1994 said to me, you know, when you take out a cataract after a trab, don't bother with 5-FU, it doesn't do anything. And, and I noticed that some of my, all of my colleagues still doing this, but I think Roger Hitchings was absolutely right. Uh, I could never, 5-FU never seemed to do anything. So we give some mitomycin at the time of cataract surgery injection. And, and I, don't know, I don't even know if that does anything. Um, but what we do do is give more steroids afterwards. Um, if, if the patient's got a trab that's working really well, I'll give a mitomycin injection and nothing else. If it's a trab that's kind of borderline function, I'd probably needle it at the same time as the cataract surgery. Um, because I'm in there anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to train in the UK and then also work in uh, Canada under Reich. And, you know, now I practice full time mm -hmm. in India. Uh, I do recognize quite a few principles that I picked up A in UK and B in Canada. Uh, but, um, you know, um, Injected mitomycin C is now something I have universally adopted, even in primary uh, traps. What do you feel about that? I, I, when we started doing Zans, I was in, injecting mitomycin. And to start with, I thought this was great. So I started doing it with traps. But I find, I find it's harder 
to get the mitomycin diffusely spread. I think when you put it on a sponge, the mitomycin goes exactly where you put it. Whereas when you inject it, it doesn't always go where you put it. I, 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 I actually put a tube in a Zen patient recently and the mitomycin white bit was over here, whereas the Zen was over here. So in other words, the mitomycin had missed the Zen completely. <laughs> <laughs> even right. though we try and spread it. And I find with the trams, I found, I found, I went back to using sponges again, because I find when you put in a sponge, the mitomycin goes exactly where the sponge is. Whereas when you're injecting it, you, 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 you try, you don't always get it in the right direction. Right. Okay. And um, what about needling? Uh, you know, when the uh, blebs are failing, do you do you do them uh, uh, on a regular basis? And I don't do it. I, I do do needling. I needle once. Okay, you know, if the patient comes to clinic and the pressure is forty, I'll probably just needle them in the clinic. The common situation that residents and fellows ask me is, you know, the patient needs a pressure of ten. The trab started with a pa say, say they started with a pressure of twenty and they needed a pressure of ten but they only got to 15, would you needle it? And my answer is no, because if the trab's half working, if you needle it, it may not work at all. <laughs> because sometimes needling can make it fail, you know, because, you know, you needle, you get blood, you get, you know. So if the trab's working, but maybe not quite enough, I won't needle it. If the trab's not working at all, I will needle it. Um, and, and that's the difference, really. And would you then uh, teach uh, massage to the patient? No, I still don't because I, 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 I just, I, yeah, I, I can't imagine. I, my colleagues do, but I, I just, the way patients massage is so random. I mean, patients can hardly even put their drops in right sometimes, you know. <laughs> Oh, okay. I do give it a go, but, uh, you know, I soon understand. Okay, people, people do, but, you know, I, I, I generally don't. Right. Um, one of our budding ophthalmologists has a question for you saying, are there any special precautions whilst operating on high hypermetropes or high, high myopes? I mean, two end of the spectrum. High hypermetropes, you really want to avoid trams if possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, non-ophthalmic eyes, I would, I don't do trabs. It's just too dangerous. I would do a tube. Um, the trouble with nanophthalmic eyes is they're so small, there's nowhere to put the tube. The anterior chamber is tiny, um, sulcus is tiny. And traditionally, I used to do pars plan of atrectomy in a bar vault. And then, you know, if you're doing pars plan of atrectomy in a pars plan of bar vault, you know, it, it needs to be pretty bad glaucoma to start doing these two and a half hour operations. But the risk of aqueous misdirection with high hypermetropes so high, we used to say, you know, never do trab in a high hypermetrope. High myopes, obviously, is the opposite. The, the risk is, uh, the risk, people say they're at high risk of hypotony. They're not at high risk of hypotony, I think. They're at a high risk of complications if you get hypotony. So you've got to be very, very careful not to get hypotony. And I think big eyes get bigger swings and pressures. So I tend to put in more sutures in the flap. Mm -hmm. What about using mitomycin C in high, high myopes? Oh, just the same. I don't think it makes it, I don't think that the scarring risk is influenced by the size of the eye. Um, I, I think it's the, you know, the fluctuations in pressure. You've just got to be much more careful with the flow control. I used to not do, I went through a phase of only doing tubes in high myopes because the, um, flow control was easier to with a bar vault and using uh, stenting techniques it was easier to control the pressure afterwards than a trab the trouble with the bar belts is you know a lot of the high myopes you really want to get low target pressures and you can't quite achieve that with the bar belt as well as you can with a trab but if they're very high myope really high myope i would be more likely to do a tube than a trab so basically what i was asking or was after was to um, you know, there's a commonly held belief that, um, and maybe true, that uh, myopes have thinner sclera, and whether mitomycin C is dangerous in such ways. No, 
I don't think, you know, I mean, I've, I've done tubes and osteogenesis imperfecta and sclerometallation and people like that. If, you got, if you're really worried about thin sclera, you shouldn't really be doing a trab because it's going to be hard to do a flap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, um, and what, what are your views regarding uh, trabeculectomy in a pigment dispersion and pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma? I think traps, I mean, the, these are often younger patients and, and it depends really on the degree of glaucoma. If these patients present with high pressures and, um, and relatively normal discs, I'd be more likely to do some kind of MIGS procedure. Um, if these patients prevent with very advanced glaucoma, then they really need, you know, they've got bad discs, bad fields, then they need a TRAB and TRABs and pigment dispersion and sort of exfoliation uh, uh, work well, I think. Almost uh, on par with the- Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. And, um, you know- I have so a question, Yeah. Um, so, so what, what about using sodium hyaluronate as a supplement instead of mitomycin C? Well, it's not, uh, you mean like Helon or Helifor yeah. or what? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's more a spacer than a, than a, you know, it has some very mild anti-inflammatory properties, but it's not really, um, uh, you know, mitomycin kills fibroblasts. It's as simple as that. It kills them dead, you know. Um, they, they, you know, you, you, it reduces scarring. These other things don't, you know, they may provide some space, um, but they don't, inhibit scarring overall. Um, yet another fairly innocent question from a budding ophthalmologist, how to manage shallow anterior chambers? And there, it depends how, you know, it, it, firstly, atropine, you know, early post-operative period, atropine is good for deepening chambers. If the eye is very hypotenuse, I might inject some viscoelastic at the slit lamp. I would tend probably to reduce the steroids a bit to accelerate he healing. And that, that's probably about it. But if it's very shallow, very hypotenous, hypotony maculopathy, I would go back to the operating theater and put in more stitches. Right, I think we are done with the questions now, unless uh, there are some others that have uh, evolved from the answers that you've just given. No? We're okay. Yes. Yeah. So really, it is now time for us to thank you. Uh, we, Pleasure. From the bottom of our hearts for giving us the time, your precious time and your effort. The, the, um, the uh, presentation was, like I said, totally riveting. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Have, thank you for the very kind invitation. That was wonderful. Have, yes. Have, have a good evening. And hope and you your, your other meeting does not last as long. <laughs> and good night. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good care. night. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Good night.